emergency debate of this term. This is the first motion that was chosen by you, the members, or rather about 42 of you. <laughs> there is a vote system which is running from uh, the homepage of our website. If you go on every week after the debate, it runs from Thursday night through to Tuesday evening, and you get a chance to pick between two motions. Tonight, the motion is this house would have picked the other milliband. Um, and next week, the two motions will be Married Stroke Valentine's theme. Um, so, proposing the motion tonight, we have Jamie Scott from Jesus and Varen Grosh from Darwin. And for the opposition, we have Ashley Walsh from Downing and Charles Reed from Christ's. So, I'd like to ask Jamie to open the case for the proposition. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This week, Ed Middleband gave an interview with Piers Morgan where he admitted, I'm a bit of a square. And I think that's, that's one issue, that's possibly the first issue uh, Ed Middleband has spoken on where I think he gathers support from all sides of the House on. I think we can all agree he is a bit of a square. Ladies and gentlemen, this summer, the Labour Party was faced with a choice of which Middleband to elect as their leader. They had a choice between David and Ed. And the Labour Party made the right choice. The majority of MPs and MEPs voted for David Miliband. The majority of party members for, for the Labour Party uh, voted in a, clear, uh, uh, in a clear majority for, for David Miliband. But it was only because of the influence of the trade unions, ladies and gentlemen, who aren't members of the Labour Party necessarily, uh, that they managed to, to put Ed uh, in his place instead of David Miliband. So we have to consider, well, why did the Labour Party make the choice that it initially did? Why did it pick David over Redwood? Uh, and, and to explain this, I'm going to focus on two substantive areas. Firstly, I'm going to look at uh, Ed Miliband's comparable political inconsistency in, uh, in his line of argument. And secondly, how they compared um, their comparable performance uh, in office during the last government and how we learned from that that David was the better leader. Um, and so, so, so that those are my two areas. So, so to move on to my first point, uh, how Ed Miliband is the more politically inconsistent of the two brothers. Uh, now the main criticism of Ed Miliband made at the moment is that he doesn't have a plan A for the economy. He doesn't have a deficit reduction plan. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, it's not so much worrying that, that he's vague on the plan. The, the real issue, I think, is that he's inconsistent. Uh, and he's been inconsistent uh, throughout uh, the year, a uh, uh, year and a half, on deficit reduction. During the campaign, uh, he tacked to the left to try and get the union votes, and he suggested the darling plan of halving the deficit in four years was, was too severe. Uh, he then said it was a starting point, without, without specifying whether it was a starting point to kind of slow down or, or, or quicken the pace. He then appointed Alan Johnson as Chancellor, uh, who was a man who agreed with the darling plan, so that was another, another change in his position. Uh, and then, just a few weeks ago, he appointed Ed Bull as his new shadow chancellor, who was a man he deliberately didn't pick in October, and this is a man who said that the Darling plan was a mistake because he felt it was too tough. So we've got a number of different positions being sketched out by Ed Miliband on the most important political issue this country faces at, the, at this present time. How do we reduce the deficit uh, and, and sustain growth? He's been very consistent, inconsistent on the issue. We don't know whether he, he supports a strategy of cutting, of cutting growth fa faster or slower than, than Darling suggested. It's not a coherent strategy, and that's not a particularly coherent opposition to the major polit political issue of the day. Compare that to David. David Miliband, who consistently towed a centrist line throughout the leadership campaign, because that was what he believed in, and he believed that, that was the most electable strategy and the most responsible opposition to the coalition. And, 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 he, and he developed uh, this centrist position uh, consistently, made the argument coherently uh, that the Darling Plan was right. So David provided that rational, credible opposition to the coalition's proposals, whereas Ed has kind of drifted all over the place, uh, and so the, the, there is no really coherent opposition uh, to the coalition on the most important and salient uh, political debate we have in this country about the deficit. So we don't think he's a responsible opposition, leader of the opposition in that respect compared to David. And secondly, I, I think there was another reason why, to move on to my second point, there was another reason why uh, the Labour Party chose uh, David Miliband rather than Ed Miliband, uh, only to have uh, the trade unions uh, oust him. Uh, and that's because if you compared their performance in government, it was clear that David Miliband was the better leader, the better politician. 
you know, you know, if you compare that to their, 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 perform their respective performances uh, in government, uh, David Miliband re received univ almost universal acclaim for his role, uh, the role, the role he performed as Foreign Secretary, uh, where he was the, the most popular choice uh, by members of the EU to, to be the EU Foreign Minister. Uh, he had good relations with the Obama administration. He had very good relations with Hillary Clinton. He did that job very well. In contrast, what did we get from Ed Miliband as Energy Secretary? Well, if we kind of remember, all we really got was we got Copenhagen, nothing really happened from that, he didn't have much influence in that. Uh, we got a third runway at Heathrow, uh, and we got kind of um, a policy to kind of expand um, coal uh, production in this country. Both arguments, bo both issues that Ed Miliband has now come out and said that he didn't really support. So all we got from him as climate secretary was a guy who didn't believe in what he was saying, and the only reason he had to say it was because he wasn't convincing enough around a cabinet table to persuade his colleagues to adopt his position. And I don't think that really kind of demonstrates the leadership that we want from the opposition. So what kind of leader do we want? What kind of leader do we want here of the opposition? We want someone who says they have the support of Hillary Clinton, like, like David Miliband, or someone who says they have the support of Hillary Benn, like Ed Miliband. Uh, and I think we want the former. So ladies and gentlemen, Ed Miliband talks about responsible opposition, but he wasn't the Miliband to provide it. Thank you. Madam Vice President, I have a problem. Now, I know you're all looking at me and thinking, no, you've definitely got more than one problem. <laughs> you, you're probably right. And actually, having met my partner in the opposition, I've realised that I have two, since he's a member of KUKA. But <laughs> there's one problem I'd like to start with tonight. For you see, I think now, nearly a year has passed. The time has now come that I can admit it. I can own up. I can come out and say it. I like Gordon Brown. Oh maybe, oh, maybe it isn't too soon. That's good. But shocking revelations aside that the chair of the Labour Club likes Gordon Brown. The reason I chose to begin with him was that not even a year ago, we were led to one of our worst election defeats of all time, since our very foundation. Yet, yesterday, a poll conducted by YouGov, a pollster not known for its support for the Labour Party since it works with Rupert Murdoch, put Ed Miliband and the Labour Party on 44% of public support. Now, quite so, I just don't think that shows a leader who isn't gaining public support or isn't being effective. Now, I'd like to make a number of rebuttals before I show how consistent and strong Ed Miliband has actually been. Because clearly my opponent doesn't actually understand what the Labour Party is. The Labour Party is simply not just a political party. It's the parliamentary and electoralist arm of the broader Labour movement, of which I'm a proud member. The Labour Party was born from socialist societies, from intellectuals, from working people, from trade unions, and continues to represent all of their hopes and aspirations. Now, since Ed Miliband gained virtually half, just a little bit under, of, of, of the European Parliamentary Labour Party, the Parliamentary Labour Party and uh, the members and gained a hefty majority amongst the working people in the Labour movement, I think that's an eminent qualification to show that he can connect with the people who are going to get really hurt over the next few years. I'd also, I'd also like to say that Ed does have a plan on deficit reduction, on, the, on growth, more than we can say for the coalition, and I'm about to discuss that in a moment, and just on whether or not he was strong as climate change secretary. Ed Miliband managed to salvage a deal when the news, nation, when the news glo globally was reporting that nothing was going to be salvaged from it. And yet America committed to reducing its emissions, China committed to investing in renewable energy, and then numerous other things. But the object of my argument tonight is to show why the Labour movement, and I, since I supported him from the start, was right to elect Ted. But since I'm extremely sanctimonious, and I'm a chair of the Labour Club, I have no intention of attacking David Miliband. I simply believe from the outset that Ed, that Ed was right, and the best choice, and here's why. Ed understands how Labour must improve. As with any long-lasting government, <coughs> We made mistakes. And it's especially true since it's the perpetual condition of the left, always to be disappointed and always to want more. Although I'm convinced that our record of gay rights, of the minimum wage, of record investment in places, and letting someone like me, a working class kid from Leeds, get into an institution like Cambridge is extremely positive. We did make mistakes. Although uh, Ed Miliband has been right to propose a graduate tax as a fair alternative to tuition fees. He said that our foreign policy should be based on morality and not on the Atlanticist Alliance. Uh, no, I didn't intervene, so uh, let me get some progress. Um, and he's also um, said that the economic crisis should not divert us from the urgent need to protect the environment. Already, Ed has improved Labour massively, and the public are rewarding us for it. But Ed also understands the biggest problem facing us in the future, not just in the past. Ed has shown that the economic masochism being implemented by this coalition is not just unnecessary, but completely immoral. 
Labour argues that we can protect the weakest in society and the most vulnerable whilst reducing the deficit adequately. Instead of cutting EMA and raising VAT, Ed has argued that we can both lock in the recovery and support those who need our help the most by abandoning things like ID cards correctly. Also apologising for one of our mistakes. Go on, I'll give you a chance. But David Miliband said that all of that as well, it just he said it better. D David Miliband was in favour of ID cards. David Miliband was in favour of tuition fees. David Miliband clearly didn't understand in the, in the full intellectual way that Ed Miliband did how the Labour Party must improve to reconnect with people again. And uh, I'd also... I'd like to point out most particularly that Ed Miliband is nailing the myth that this economic crisis was caused by public spending before 2008. Before the financial crisis, our public debt, as Ed Miliband has shown, was um, the second lowest in the G7. Our unemployment was stable and it's some of its lowest ever levels. Thank you very much. And um, interest rates were at some of the lowest and stablest levels. Ed has shown that the economic crisis was caused by a global breakdown in financial regulation, not by some kind of socialist profligacy. And who thought Labour, New Labour was socialist anyway? Certainly not I. Um, but, and, and, but, but the and therefore, that the coalition's economic strategy is based on nothing more than a barefaced lie. It also shows why Ed believes that the deficit should be paid down by those both who caused the crisis and who can bear the biggest burden. And thus, Ed has shown the complete hypocrisy of the coalition arguing that we're all in it together, whilst bankers can get away with a lighter bonus tax than last year, tax evaders like George Osborne, like Philip Hubbard, can get away with not paying their tax whilst they expect children, pensioners, vulnerable and the unemployed to pay for the deficit reduction. But, but Madam President, it's clear that Emil just doesn't have the most important values, compassion and social justice and equality, the values that we in the Labour, the Labour movement, not just the Labour Party, hold dearest. But he understands exactly what Labour must do in order to connect with the mainstream majority of British politics to defend the hard, the hard working majority and what we must do in order to take Britain forward again. But don't just take my word for it. Take the word of that 44% or the thousands who have joined Labour since, we, since Ed Miliband was elected. All those who can see that Ed is taking the arguments of the coalition and beating them. Quite simply, I'm proud that we in the Labour movement chose to elect Ed Miliband. I'd now like to open the debate to the floor. Please keep speeches to one minute and give your name and college before you start. Uh, for those of you who weren't paying attention, the motion is this house would have picked the other Miliband. Um, does anyone have a speech for the proposition? For the opposition? Any speech? <laughs> Any speech is an extension. <laughs> uh, Chris, let's go for Christopher Stanton from the Peace House. I think there's something very sad that the dawn of the 21st century. We're having a debate about which of two brothers from a fairly narrow social background, metropolitan poor and also educated, can lead the Labour Party <coughs> to institutions. Here's a radical idea. Why don't we try and let people based on not what their last name is, but what their achievements are, and what companies are substantial improvements they made by this country. Or Has anyone thought of anything they'd like to say on behalf of the proposition since I last asked? <laughs> Yeah. 
with the political parties who captures our imagination with policy and ideas and real vision for the future, not the person who looks the least likely to offend our sensibilities of what is and isn't normal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this debate is about the future of this country and therefore the future of the Labor Party. And this country needs an electable Labor Party in order to have a viable future. So I, for one, don't step away from New Labor for one moment. But what we heard from Ashley was that he wasn't interested in the electability of the Labor Party. He liked Gordon Brown. <laughs> I didn't vote for him, though. He thought we should go back to being a Labor movement. Back to socialism. And he thought 44% for Ed Miliband yeah, recently. Come on. 44% for Ed Miliband recently actually means something. Well, yes, David Cameron's policies are unpopular. Yes, he's, he's, the austerity measures were never going to be everybody's cup of tea. But those numbers are soft for Miliband because in the next election, when it comes time to make a responsible choice about who's going to lead the country, Red Ed's just not on people's minds. There are two points I'd make in terms of electability. The first is that elections are won in the centre. And if you really want to generate progressive outcomes, the Labor Party needs to win elections. Before 1997, couldn't, couldn't do that. Just couldn't do that. And what we see with Ed, and what we see with the people who voted for Ed, is an analysis that goes, you know what, we lost the 2010 election and the reason we lost it was that people thought New Labour was too responsible on the economy and too far away from the trade union movement, which is just ridiculous. Go on, one comrade to another. Comrade. Oh, very good. <laughs> Firstly, the, the third section of the Labour Electoral College isn't just the trade unions. In fact, the trade unions form less than a majority of that college. It's actually political and intellectual societies which form it. And secondly, I'm, I'm as far on the political centre as anybody else is, although I don't think the brand of New Labour is an electable one for the future. Ed has actually come up with a more electable alternative than New Labour, which was discredited. <laughs> <laughs> Th 
three elections, more than the Labor Party's ever won before. Ever. Probably more than it looks like ever winning again under Ed Miliband. <laughs> what, was, what the 2010 election said was, one, the Iraq war was an absolute disaster. Brain fade by Blair and people wanted to punish him for it. And two, the people really didn't like Gordon Brown. They just didn't. That's why they went to the Lib Dems and not the Tories. They just didn't like the guy. And, and frankly, who can blame them? But it's, it's about, this is what parties do. They go back to their base when they lose elections. What they don't do is learn from other parties, like the Conservatives, who spent a long time in opposition as they recycled Tory pinup boy after Tory pinup boy, and then finally they got back with their amiably moon-faced, middle-of-the-road <laughs> media man, and they won an election. And, that, and that's David Miliband. He's electable. The second reason, and, and I, I agree with the gentleman in the gallery, that Ed is simply too goofy to be Prime Minister. He's not Prime Ministerial. It's, it's a little bit like you could never really see Bob Dole as Prime, uh, President of the United States. It's just not going to happen. And with, with Ed Miliband, it's the same, yeah. Well, Bush became President. <laughs> I'm going to earn the lasting enmity of this chamber, but I think Bush was quite a charming fellow. <laughs> Awful policies, but again, he won two elections, and he didn't do that because he was good with words. <laughs> but, but the same is true about Blair and Brown, right? And if Tony Blair was leading the Labor Party at the 2010 election, those people wouldn't have gone home. We would have still been in government. So I'd say, in conclusion, that Ed is an unbackable favourite in the race to historical irrelevance. So let's get behind David. We are proud to propose. I'd now like to ask Charles to place the case for the opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, I have one thing to say um, which the proposition has not mentioned at all um, in their worship of David Miliband. Does anyone remember a certain banana incident involving <laughs> David Miliband? <laughs> As most of you already know, I imagine, David Miliband da um, severely damaged his chances of ever becoming Labour, Labour leader when he let himself be photographed in public Raving a banana like a monkey. <laughs> That's not using my words. Um, one, oh. this alone suggests that he is not the right leader to become, the man to become leader of a major political party. One Conservative MEP has even privately said that he is a publicity disaster waiting to happen for Labour. Especially in an age where image, unfortunately, appears to matter more than um, policy substance in politics, um, this is not the right um, man to be the le a leader. Yeah, go, go. <laughs> but, but bananas are very nutritious food. Food, isn't that what we want from a leader of an opposition? Someone who's healthy and robust? <laughs> well, uh, Fruit is um, but people don't tend to like eating fruit, unfortunately, so I don't like leaders who say they like eating fruit. <laughs> Would be the obvious one to that. Um, uh, why do... No, I'm not, going to I'm not going to continue talking about fruit. Anyway. <laughs> Secondly, though, neither would David be any better than Ed in terms of actual policy. David Miliband's leadership campaign promised to steer Labour's policies towards the centre ground of British politics in order to attract back middle-income voters to the Labour Party. But Ed seems to have done this better than David, David's um, campaign promised. In November, Ed promised to defend the squeezed middle classes, opposing child benefit cuts for middle-income earners. 
opposing higher tuition fees for middle class students and defending universal benefits for middle class pensioners. Uh, he has even followed a more centrist economic policy than the Brown government did, implying on several occasions that he would cut faster than the Darling plan. Um, and although he has appointed Ed Balls, the infamous Brownite, as Shadow Chancellor, the appointment was on the condition that he would tow this new line, which is why the Shadow Chancellor's communication office has been merged with the leader of opposition in order to gag anything that Ed Balls wants to say which is not in the party line. <laughs> um, it even seems that if David was leader and had the ch chance to steer the Labour Party's policies any more towards the centre ground than Ed has already done, they would end up further to the right than the coalition has. But I, although I am no fan of Ed Miliband, I am not a Labour supporter, but I am a um, critical editor of a student newspaper. Um, to my s utter surprise, um, he's actually performed quite well so far as Labour leader. Although he was um, elected with the help of trade union votes, they seem to have got done very badly for their votes and their money, seeing that he hasn't really campaigned on that many union um, union issues and has um, opposed the um, their direct action against the cuts. Instead of swinging to the left, the cautious pro-middle Britain policies Edge has tried to follow have appeared to be working. In spite of the coalition's long honeymoon period, Labour has, support been, has performed surprisingly well in the polls, averaging over 40% since Ed Miliband has come to power um, as Labour leader compared to less than 30% before he was elected and 29% of the last election. Today's YouGov poll even shows Labour an eight-point lead over Conservatives, and if there was a general election tomorrow, they would have a thumping majority of over 100 MPs. With results like these, I cannot arrive at any other conclusion that Labour elected the right Miliband as leader. Let's put it like this. Could Labour do any better under David Vened? I don't think the evidence has particularly shown that they, ha that they could. Could Labour afford another banana slip-up, as David has uh, shown that um, he's frequently capable of? Um, in my opinion, no. De Neil Kinnock, falling into the sea on live television in the 1980s, contributed to the Labour Party's long spell in opposition to 1997. As they, don't, as they don't need another um, monkey-like leader, I urge you all to oppose this motion this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. As ever, we vote by acclamation. So when I ask for votes for the proposition, you shout aye, and when I ask for votes for the opposition, you shout nay. Um, in the last couple of weeks it's been pretty tight, so can you please put your the, like, enthusiasm into it the first round so we don't have to do it twice again, it's just getting a bit embarrassing. Right, votes for the proposition. Aye! Votes for the opposition. Nay!
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the union and thank you for coming along tonight. Uh, the motion before the House is this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. Um, I'll introduce the speakers and then, and then we'll begin. For the proposition, we've got the Right Honourable David Lammy, Labour MP for Tottenham since 2000 and under Gordon Brown was Minister for Universities, Innovation and Skills. We then have Nigel Farage, MEP, Leader of UKIP and MEP for South East England. And wrapping up with the proposition, the Right Honourable David Blunkett, MP for Sheffield since 1987 and former Home Secretary. So thank you for the proposition. Liberal Democrat MP since 1992 and the party's education spokesman under Paddy Ashdown. Rupert Myers, who is um, an old one here, barrister and economist for The Guardian. And to sum up, the Right Honourable Andrew Mitchell, former Vice Chairman of the Conservative Party, current Secretary of State for International Development and former Union President. So, welcome to the opposition. Well, I'm really pleased to get that reception, particularly because I've been giving Cambridge a little bit of a hard time for who gets to come here uh, 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 at the moment. Um, I, I want people to take themselves back to 2008 and take them themselves back to the beginning of this global crisis. And as you do that, think about the truth of whether, in fact, the situation we find ourselves in is down to a Labour government, because you will recognise that we entered a global crisis that wasn't just happening in Britain, it was certainly happening in America where it began, and it was affecting most of the developed world. Indeed, if you believed much of what is said at the dispatch box from members of the government, you would blame the crisis in Ireland, uh, uh, in Greece, and potentially in Spain on the Labour government. That is in fact not the case. Every now and then in the economic cycle you will get those who argue on the extreme right that the way to see yourself out of a problem is to cut savagely at the deficit. These people made the same argument just after the Second World War. And thank God the British people voted for a Labour government who instead of cutting, despite the huge debts that Britain found itself in, having faced down the Nazis in Germany and won the Second World War, instead of cutting, we invested. We built the NHS. We invested in schools and the beginning of the comprehensive education system following the 1944 Education Act. That was the Labour government in that period, and indeed it is why if you look to America, if you look even actually to centre-right governments in France and in Germany, as well as attempting to cut the deficit, there is also an element of fiscal stimulus. A fiscal stimulus that keeps people in jobs. And that is why I say that this government, in arriving in office and cutting the future jobs fund, was making a huge mistake, a mistake that is leading to mass youth unemployment. Ask yourself why it is that one in five graduates are unemployed in this country. And my friend, I don't know how well travelled you are. I don't know if you've been to China, if you've been to India, if you've spent time looking at the nature of the American economy. But you will understand that the prospects for Britain are bleak if we don't have a highly skilled economy. And that's why we set a target, which we never reached in fact, but we set a target and an aim. And it's why it is right that young people achieve those higher level skills. But let me continue. Because I happen to believe 
that the central charge against this government is their, is their lack of understanding about how we get to growth. My view is you do have to invest in young people. That's why I'm concerned that we've seen cuts as early as Sure Start and Children's Centres, with 250 disappearing in this country this year. That's why I think it's wrong to cut local government by 30% in year. What does that mean in practice? It means that the youth services for many of the young people in Cambridge who are a long way from this institutions will be cut. There will be no youth centres. There will be no youth workers. And in a constituency like mine, what are the repercussions? You've seen those headlines about knife crime. Is that really the kind of country that we want to live in? How can you be investing in growth when you make the most gross decision of any developed nation in the world, and that is to effectively privatise higher education. It is an outrage that arts, humanities and the social sciences have effectively been taken out of the teaching grant. Even in America, I will come to that in a minute, even in America, where there are great state universities, they have not departed from higher education and the funding, state funding, for higher education in arts and the social humanities. How are we to get out of this mess if we haven't got good social scientists, if we haven't got uh, people who are disciplined in the arts and humanities, working with economies, uh, economists, working with scientists? This is, not, this is not how to get to growth. This is how to take the country backward. It is Philistine. There is no other developed nation doing it. I take your point. You know, when you hear this phrase, free money from the state, it's important to defend the state. I'm here because I had a good state education. I'm here because I was raised by a single mother and we lived in a country where people pooled their resources to help my mother with her child benefit when my father left us. And it is wrong, I think, to give the presumption that this is free money for people earning over 40,000. Let me finish the point. Let me finish the point. It is wrong to take from pregnant women the benefits that they deserve to ensure that their children grow up with better prospects. It's wrong to, catch, to cut the child uh, trust fund. It's wrong to cut child benefit. It's wrong to put this country in a situation where we will end up like Paris because of changes to housing benefit, where we'll see an exodus from inner London to outer London and people living in squalor and overcrowded in the fifth richest economy in Britain. That is wrong. And I lay that at a Conservative government effectively with the Lib Dem supine in this administration and with effectively the children of Margaret Thatcher not pursuing a centre-right agenda but a seriously Thatcherite agenda. And I say representing the poorest constituency in this country that this will set Britain backward just as other nations are moving forward. This is a path that will lead to a divided nation. That is why you should be very, very concerned at the decisions that are being made. Just even within the first six months of this administration, things that were never anywhere near the manifesto coming to bear. What is this change that's being made to the NHS? Who voted for it? Who's arguing for it? Because GPs aren't. I tell you who's arguing for it. Big Pharma. They're the people that are going to benefit from this change, the pharmaceutical companies. They're the only people in the NHS who are arguing for this change. No one else voted for it. An NHS that was not a big political issue, largely because of the changes we'd made and the many queues 
but people had the, the length of time people had to wait for, for, for operations reduced as a result of this government. And that's what we've seen. And then we get this terrible situation, appalling situation, where the children uh, of Margaret Thatcher, and I, I have to say at least she was a, a politician of conviction, decide to sell off our forests on the sly, to sell off our forests on the sly, so that even conservative backbenchers yesterday standing up in the House of Commons and saying, why? Why are we doing this? Who voted for it? Where did this come from? Now, I urge you, I urge you to vote with us and to stand up to a government that's moved from an opportunity, I think, to govern from the centre, working with the Lib Dems, to an extreme position where we're cutting the deficit too fast and where the social unrest and the problems for a decade of young, for a generation of young people will be greatly, greatly... Um, Since it's very clear you're coming to the end of your remarks, might you just tell the House what cuts the Labour government were planning to make? You know, it's funny, because... Uh, because... Uh, on, you know that in government there is no minister more than I that spent more time on television having to defend the cuts that I was making in higher education before the general election. But what were the cuts I was making? I was cutting capital. I was cutting the building or extra building in our universities. I was not cutting our teaching resources. I was not trebling debt for young people. You should be ashamed, as a Lib Dem, that you've gone with this government down that path. Madam President, it's a great honour to be here speaking in this august chamber with so many august politicians. But I'm conscious, regardless of how you're going to vote tonight, you view politicians of all political parties uh, with suspicion, particularly Nigel Farage. But I'm very... <laughs> but, 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 but I am conscious that the best phrase that was ever made about politicians was fairly recently when somebody said... The politicians, like babies' nappies, should be changed regularly for exactly the same reason. <laughs> now, I want to argue that on this occasion, what you've just heard from David Lammy is the equivalent of the contents of a baby's nappy. It was, it was totally and absolutely deficient, I will in a second, totally and absolutely deficient of any humility whatsoever. He quite rightly said, quite rightly said, that all of the problems the country faced can't all be laid at the previous Labour government's door. That's absolutely correct. But there's so much more the Labour government could have done to put us into a stronger situation than we are. And I want to argue tonight that you can have real confidence in a government that is prepared to tackle some of the real issues facing this country, a government that comprises two opposing political parties that have come together for the sake of the country. And I want to argue that there's no way can you have confidence in the official opposition that so badly let down this country that created in part much of the mess that we've got. And through, more importantly, the erosion of civil liberties showed that it was not interested in trusting the people of this country. I do trust them and I trust this intervention. Uh, yeah. Let's show the Labour Club through. They'll be sick of seeing me by now, but if he was talking a load of rubbish, why on earth did you argue the same thing at the election? Well, we certainly did. We, no. Look, we certainly didn't. 
But one of the things, I'll come back to that if I may in a second. What, no, 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 I mean, it, it's, such, it's such an important point, it deserves to have real attention to it rather than the glib response, so I will do just that. But let's just remember, let's just remember the situation we're in. We have a structural deficit, the worst throughout Europe, £153 billion. Pounds. We're spending more every year than we actually get in from taxes and other receipts. It is adding to the debt of this country so that every year we're currently paying off £43 billion pounds in debt interest repayments alone. That is more than we spend on the whole of education for our schools in this country and we have got to do something about it. The Labour Party claimed they were in fact going to make cuts but now of course they won't tell us what they were. This government has got a clearly, of course I will, we'd love to, we'd love to hear what your proposals are. <laughs> That is the consequence of cutting the Future Jobs Fund. That is the consequence uh, of graduates coming out of university without anything to do. That will lead to a bigger problem in terms of the country's financial situation. Well, of, of course, David, you will be 100% right. No, no, you should applaud him because he's right in saying that if we get it wrong and there are more people unemployed, it will be a real disaster for this country. David, you're absolutely right. But what all the independent bodies have said is that our plans will actually create more jobs in this country than anything that would have happened under Labour. The IFS... David, did... David, sorry, get up and tell me, did you read the IFS study yesterday, which actually... Met, uh, David, I'm uh, delighted to get rid... Well done, David. We're going to be 2.8 million people unemployed. David. 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 The IFS report specifically said that were we to deflect from the course of action currently being followed, there would be an economic catastrophe in this country, and you know it if you read the whole of the report. But can I just make a bit of progress and then happily will? And one of the things that's interesting is that already, notwithstanding uh, the bit of gloom in the recent figures, overall if you look at them, there's... No, 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 wait, you've got to... No, guys, look. In fairness, you don't take just one set of figures. Look at the totality. The manufacturing in this country fell down from 20% of GDP to 11% of GDP under a Labour government. Already under a coalition government, those figures are rising. More jobs are being created in the manufacturing sector than ever before. It's going to be helped by the 50,000 additional apprenticeship posts that the coalition government is putting into place. There are many other measures that we are taking. If you look at what the opposition have got, it inspires no confidence whatsoever. They have got no policies. They keep changing what happens in terms of their treasury spokesman, their shadow chancellor has changed twice. We had the first one that came along, who clearly had no idea about economics at all, suggested that there was VAT, suggested that there was VAT on children's clothing, suggested that employee NI contributions were 20%, which is completely wrong. And then we got another one who's trying to get rid of all the brown stains on him before he can start to decide what the new Labour Party's economic policies are going to be. They really haven't got any policies. But I want to pick up on one area that I believe passionately you should care about and why you should actually support the proposals of the coalition government and oppose the motion tonight. And that's in the area about trusting in people. It's about the issue of civil liberties. One of the biggest debaters 150 years ago, standing right here, was John Stuart Mill. He produced, just after he debated here over a number of years, a pamphlet called On Liberty, in which he argued that the rights of individuals were being eroded at that time. If he was listening to what's happening now, he'd be turning in his grave. Because under a Labour government, we've seen a huge erosion of our civil liberties. And I will give some very specific examples. David, OK. Just on this point, did he also argue that you should kettle young people if white no. Well, no, David, what, what he actually said, let's quote it, because he said this, the worth of the state in the long run is the worth of the individuals composing it. 
a state which dwarfs its men in order that they may be more docile instruments in its hands, even for beneficial purposes, will find that with small men, no great things can be accomplished. Who would have imagined under a Labour government we'd have a situation where they would have sought to lock people up without charge for 90 days? Who would have thought under a Labour government you would have actually banned protest, political protest in Parliament Square? Who would imagine under a Labour government somebody could be arrested and charged for reading out the names of the war dead in Afghanistan at the Cenotaph because she didn't have a permit to do so? Who could have imagined that they would have introduced or sought to introduce ID cards? Who could have imagined we'd live in a state of surveillance where this country has 1% of the world's population and 20% of the world's CCTV cameras? What has happened has been a total erosion. If you accept we can argue about economic policy, the one thing, the one thing I hope you would at least acknowledge is the crucial developments that have taken place already in respect of civil liberties under this coalition government. Abolishing identity cards, extending freedom of information, getting more regulation on CCTV, getting pre-charge detention down to 14 days, and so it goes on. All of these things have made a huge difference. Uh, and I think will continue to make a difference. And finally, what we're doing is we're cleaning up politics. Oh! We're... <laughs> David. Sorry, David Blunt. David, I... <laughs> we, we will love to hear what you have to say. David, 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 before I sit down, just nod in answer to these things. Do you believe that they should have a fair voting system in this country which we are seeking to have a referendum on? Yes or no? Nod and tell us. Do you believe in fixed term parliaments? Do you want more equal constituency? Do you want to have a reform of party funding? Do you want to have an elected second chamber? You promised you'd do it. You never did it in all of the times that you were there. David, there are many things, and I say to each and every one of you here, you can have confidence in a coalition government that has confidence in the people of this country, where two parties are willing to come together in the interests of the country and not for purely party political gain. You cannot have any confidence in that lot. President, ladies and gentlemen, good evening everybody. And what a delight it is, what a delight it is to be the UKIP sandwich between the two Labour men here. And David Blunkett said earlier he never thought we'd be on the same side. I doubt, David, we ever will be again. But I must say, I do think that this motion is well worth supporting. And it's sad that it is, because what do you think about it, folks? Marriage, in many ways, is a very beautiful thing, isn't it? <laughs> and how moving it was on that beautiful May afternoon <laughs> to see that young couple <laughs> together in the Rose Garden in Downing Street. And everybody thought, it's a beautiful, beautiful marriage. It's a match made in heaven. Goodness knows the country wished them well. Because, and let's be fair, that old Labour government with that tired, dull Prime Minister, deserved to go. And there was no question about that. But, but there was talk of new politics, there was talk of a fresh start. And I wondered myself, just how long would this honeymoon last? And here we are. Just eight months into the marriage, and it's all gone horribly wrong. Because those of us that have been through divorces, I'm certainly one, will know, will know, thank you, I accept the point. But those of us that have been through divorces know the one thing that breaks down a marriage, the one thing that kills it. Well, 
We may come to that in a moment. And that was a nice try, but it wasn't terribly funny, really, was it? <laughs> no, the one thing that kills a marriage, that breaks it down, that destroys it, is, of course, when there is a breakdown in trust. And I would put it to this House tonight that the reason that you should vote for this motion, the reason that you should not have confidence in this government, is because within eight months, we as a country simply don't trust them. And Nick Clegg, of course, comes very near the top of that list. Those of you as students will remember, do you remember that pledge he stood there with? No to increases in tuition fees. I've no doubt Don Foster was photographed. You were. Absolutely. Well done. <laughs> Well done. I think you've just helped this side of the House with that nod enormously. But there was the promise that they made. And even if we accept that in a coalition there needs to be some degree of compromise, for Clegg to have made that mistake, I believe, means that people will never, ever, in the foreseeable future, trust the Lib Dems again. I think the Lib Dems, as a party in Britain, are holed below the waterline. And the reason that Don Foster got a bit arsy with me earlier is because, and he knows this, but he'd rather you didn't know this, that of course, two weeks ago, Don, in the YouGov poll, with voting intentions of 18 to 24-year-olds, for the first time in British history, UKIP are now above the Liberal Democrats because you've <laughs> lost their confidence. <laughs> it's right, yes. You don't like it, do you? <laughs> Unlike you, sir, unlike you, sir, I do not wish for there to be a British government which is no more than a manager of our affairs because it's given away the ability to make 75% of our laws to foreign institutions. And the only promise, the only promise that I've ever made is if I get near power, I'll give these people a referendum so they can decide their future. That's a pretty fundamental difference, in my opinion. Now, the other reason why trust has broken down isn't just because of Clegg isn't just because of what he's done to students, isn't because he is now, of course, effectively priced out of the market, many of those people who ought to be going to university. No, it's not just him. The Tory party are much the same. Now, David Cameron, I remember friends of mine saying, Nigel, we couldn't contemplate voting for you. We've got to get rid of Labour. We want to get the Tories in. And just you wait till David Cameron gets elected. Just you wait till David gets in. You'll see someone there who's honest, sound and true. And of course, one of his biggest promises, and he wrote this, of course, in the Sun newspaper. So it's amazing what party leaders write, isn't it, in, in, in the Murdoch press. But David Cameron wrote, I give you this cast iron guarantee that if I win the general election, I'll make sure the people of this country get a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. Well, that promise has gone just a little rusty, has it not? He's given away on that. He promised that a Conservative government or a Conservative-led government would try to repatriate powers from Europe. And actually what he's done is he's allowed the ludicrous Baroness Ashton <laughs> to have, yet I see you agree with that at least, to have more power over foreign policy. He's given away control, regulation and management of the whole of Britain's biggest industry in financial services and there are millions of traditional Conservative voters out there who I don't think will ever trust David Cameron again. But I wonder what the motivation of these people is. I genuinely believe that Mr Cameron enjoys having the keys of the door to number 10. I also believe that Nick Clegg, frankly, can't believe his luck. I mean, he's in a most wonderful position personally. But are they really standing up for the interests of this country? One little example that comes to mind is a recent judgment that said that we have to give prisoners the vote. Now, I'm sure, as good, sensible people here in the Union, you would agree with me that if you go to prison, for that period of time that you're there, your democratic rights are suspended and you should not have the vote. I'm sure you'd all agree with that. <laughs> 
But whether or not you agree with the idea or not, <laughs> the real point is that David Cameron, as British Prime Minister, said it made him sick to the bottom of his stomach that we had to accept this judgment, but accept it we do. Now, is that the kind of talk we expect to hear from a British Prime Minister? I would suggest that he's not interested in this country, he's not really interested in our democracy, he's not really interested in our self-government, he's interested in maintaining this coalition, he's interested in staying there as his old cleggy till 2015 and these things matter more. And I would question too, I must question the competence of this government or certain individuals within it. Now this of course is not unique in British history. We've had incompetent ministers since the dawn of time. But just think about, just think about St. Vince, the man who a year ago was, was lauded, was he not, as the great financial guru and genius, the man who succumbed to the temptations from two young women. Now, of course, there are some on this side of the house that have suffered these problems in the tabloids before, <laughs> and, and I hold my own hands up to that. But it was a pretty stupid, wasn't it? A pretty inexperienced thing for Vince to have done. So now what's happened is he's now spoken out against Murdoch. So as business secretary, he's not allowed to appear on the television or on the radio or comment in the newspapers. A totally neutered minister in what is increasingly becoming a totally neutered government. The government has lost respect. And I'm afraid this continuing trend in British politics is that we have people running our lives, none of whom have any experience of the real world at all. Nick Clegg left here, went to work for the ever-popular Leon Britton. He then, of course, became an MEP, which I can assure you is not a proper job at all. <laughs> And now he's the Deputy Prime Minister, David Cameron, straight from university into a research office, never done a proper job in his life, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, well he's never even had a paper round. So we've got a group of people running us, they're running us badly, they've broken their promises, they've lost faith, they've lost trust, and I think overwhelmingly, I'm sure, you as the student community, you as the people above all, who've been ratted on by this government will overwhelmingly support this motion. Thank you. people here this evening. Somebody once said that there's a direct correlation between the number of people watching you and the stupidity of your actions. I've sat here and I've listened to what uh, three of the finest politicians money can buy have said. And I've, I, I, I'm coming to that and I've been amazed. First of all, we'll start with uh, Mr. Blunkett who sits there yeah, and goes, who sits, <laughs> he hasn't started but he has muttered throughout and one of the things he has, one of the things he has repeatedly muttered is, hmm, what about David Laws, what about David Laws, David Laws was out of the coalition, as if, as if there's some sort of statute on of limitations on one's own personal embarrassments yeah, and, well, and, and being forced to retire. David Laws resigned for personal reasons. Mr. Blunkett has resigned. Mr. Blunkett resigned. Mr. Blunkett resigned because he was chatting up women in Annabelle's nightclub. I don't think it befits him to start criticising other people for the mistakes that he has made. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like a. Well, this is the point. You say get on to substance, but all we've heard so far from you is, is, is a series of ad hominem attacks on people. You know, look at Vince Cable. He's a waste of time, etc., etc. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Mr. Farage, of course, who, who famously came very close to death um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an aircraft accident. Um, you, uh, you have to take you have to take you, 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 you have to take a certain amount of chutzpah, courage, some might say foolishness, to be the leader of the UKIP party. Uh, but what he said, which was particularly interesting, was that he effectively alleged, as an MEP, who runs a party that will never see government or come anywhere close to it, that the Liberal Democrats are just in it for the, for the fun of it, for the titles. Well, Mr. Farage, you know full well that you're an honorary MEP, you've been voted into that office, one imagines that you have a very splendid time doing it, but you're no more constructive uh, to the public than, than, than the least of the people in this coalition government, because at least they have had the courage to do something that the people in the Labour Party and the United, United Kingdom Independence Party never did. And there was a period in British government when that courage was lacking. It was before everybody voted in the last election. Because you watch those vacuous, empty, miserable, pathetic debates where those three men skirted the issues. They did not tell you what this would cost. They did not tell you what they would do. They wanted you to vote for them because of what they said, how they looked, you know, what they did with their spare time, whether they jogged or not. But they didn't tell you where the cuts would come. Now the difference is and it's an important difference, is that the men on this side of the house, not me, I for once as a barrister am feeling oddly popular because I'm not one of these five politicians, they at least have put their credibility on the line. They have put their names, what history will make of them, on the line by standing up, by forming a coalition. God knows they didn't agree before the election. I think everybody knows the Liberal Democrat Party and the Conservative Party have had their differences. And they have worked together for the national good. Not for the national gravy train. Not so they can kettle some people. I mean, it is rich. It is thicker than gravy coming from a member of the last Labour government to suggest that kettling is the height of inhumane treatment. What was Tony Blair saying about Guantanamo Bay? What was Gordon Brown saying about Guantanamo Bay? What were they saying when they tried to extend the length of time that you could hold these people in this country without charge, without evidence, in order to carry out your investigations and at the end of it not charge anybody you my friend you Mr Lammy and I'll come to you in a minute I'll come to you in a minute but you Mr Lammy and you Mr Blunkett have presided over a government which was complicit in denying every right imaginable to some people on this planet. So the idea that you can't keep a group of people who are protesting and in some cases causing criminal damage and threatening life in an area for a short period of time is, is the pot calling the kettle back. But go on, say what you want to say. You've, the, you've forgotten it. I don't know, I, 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 I haven't forgotten it, but you know, you've always got to be careful when you're accompanied with a barrister pomposity you can almost feel. Look, the, 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 it, 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 it's, simply, it's simply to suggest that the hype was not just the kettling. It is actually 15-year-old children. It is cutting EMA for some of the poorest children in this country. It includes benefits. That is the hype. That is what we are challenging. It's a, fair, it's a fair comeback. Um, locking people up without trial for several years, burning copies of the Quran in front of them and, and effectively torturing them is equivalent to cutting the amount of money you pay to people over the age of 16 to stay in school. Thank you, Mr. Lammy. That was a, a remarkably clever and courageous point. Now, <laughs> politicians, and I'm not a politician, but I'm in the company of them, so I have to sort of speak the lingo, tend to tell you what they're about and where they're from. My parents chose to have me when I was born through the NHS. It was under a conservative administration and there was a nine month wait. <laughs> as, far as, as far as I'm aware, that has not come down despite all of the spending made by the Labour government, <laughs> despite all of that money. And the doctors came and they said to my parents, I'm sorry, we did everything we could, but he pulled through. <laughs> my, when, when one of my relatives died, uh, the doctor came out and broke the news to my parents and said, well, either she's dead or my watch has stopped. Now, I don't know how much investment has gone into the NHS over the last couple of years. I'm sure that these gentlemen will tell you more. Uh, but it's billions. 
I was at a school in Leicester a couple of weekends ago. It was like the deck of the Starship Enterprise. It was so new and shiny and beautiful. I've been to schools around the country. I used to do access work when I was here at Cambridge to encourage people from backgrounds much unlike my own to go to university. And all of these schools were gleaming, glistening, beautiful places in which you could eat food off the floor. But I talked to a kid, you know, and I said, I, I said to him, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he goes, I want to be in the army. And I said, well, that sounds, that sounds good. Where you live near a particular range that I had shot at with the, uh, uh, with the, with the, with the military. And I said, have you ever gone shooting there? And he goes, no, but I have, I have, I have shot before. I said, well, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, I've got an air rifle. And I shoot people on the estate with it. <laughs> and I said, you probably don't want to tell the army recruitment officers that. <laughs> and he said, no, I did. They loved it. The first point in relation to that story is that the building schools... Well, no, it's... It's not irrelevant. It's funny and it's relevant for this reason. Right? The Building Schools for the Future project, the aim of which was to renovate every school in the country. Every single one. Because that sounds easy, good. You can put that in your Daily Mail column. Right? Every school in the country. So, however poor, however clever, however rich, however stupid the kids, however good or bad the area, every school in the country. Does that sound like sensible economic management to you? It doesn't. Yes. It doesn't to me. Yes. Well, what about spending money wisely? What about saying, we're not going to give child benefits to everybody, irrespective of their income. We're going to give them to the people who need it. You see, Mr. Lamy's response to that was to tell us about his upbringing and completely avoid the fact that his parents clearly weren't multi-millionaires who were claiming child benefit. It's, it's <laughs> this concept of a universal benefit is a total misnomer. We need to spend our limited resources better and more carefully. And the lack of courage that you hear so far from the proposition is in knocking every single cut. It's very easy to knock a cut. But not once have you heard a breath of what these people would do. In Mr Farage's case, because he doesn't give a toss. In the, in the case of the other two, they didn't have a plan because they knew they were screwed. And now they don't have a plan because they can't agree on it. Alan Johnson was in favour of this coalition government's changes to university funding. Alan Johnson's resignation, to be fair, did not really add up. But neither could he. The problem, the problem that... <laughs> the problem that, that Ed Balls has is that he and Ed Miliband also don't agree. So how many years will it be before Mr Lammy, before, uh, before Mr Blunkett are given talking points by the Labour Party in which they can say something constructive? Because you've heard nothing constructive from them so far. I'm not here as a talking piece for this side. But when I see two parties in government airing their differences... I am reassured, because memories are not so short as Mr Blunkett's who forgets he's had his own scandals, all right? Memories go back to the point where we had Tony Blair as our leader, and you've been hearing in the Chilcot Inquiry this week uh, evidence from <coughs> senior civil servants saying that effectively, at the time Tony Blair was in the run-up to the decision to go to war in Iraq, he was not having cabinet meetings at which cabinet ministers <coughs> received the information about what the legal advice was, about what the plans were. Tony Blair was taking groups of people who agreed with him onto a sofa, chatting about it. No formal minutes, no documentation. And suddenly, bam. And Mr Blunkett, to be fair to him, is one of the people who actually stood up. So I don't want to criticise him. But that was... No, no, I, well, I, I criticise you for other things. But the point is... <laughs> The point is this, when everybody loved Tony, we arguably, and the jury is still out, and Mr Chilcott will tell us, could have committed war crimes. And we could have done that, and, and people have said almost as much, we could have done that because there weren't the checks and balances. Because we elected a leader with a glossy smile and you know, shiny teeth who could play football and play the guitar, and everybody loved him. Yeah, yeah. And nobody, could, nobody disagreed with him. Instead, now, we have a government with two parties working together in opposition to each other's policies, but together for the national interest. 
I don't think we're as likely to commit those sorts of grave mistakes as the Iraq War or 45 minutes or weapons of mass destruction under this administration than under the last one, which was a cult of the personality. And for that reason, I beg you to oppose this motion. Proposition of the motion. Cynthia Wallace, Morning College. Uh, we've talked about the all pervasive issue of the economy and the equally pressing issue of the Lisbon Treaty. Um, but there's also <laughs> much that we haven't touched on. Uh, what about the government's much anticipated bond fire of the Quangos, which may have cost far more money than it ever saved? How does that qualify as more careful use of unlimited resources? What about having promised an end to shake ups of the NHS for no apparent reason? This government will preside over the most pointless and most contested shake up of the NHS. What about the fact that the Director of Communications has already managed what Alistair Campbell couldn't do in a decade, which is committed quite unpleasant enough that he has to be sacked? <laughs> <laughs> what about the fact that the big society, David Cameron's big vision for our future and for our future, is nothing more than the collective realisation of the Conservative Party that actually when people get together and help each other, it helps us move forward? How, do, how is this a, a competent government that we should have confidence?
where we are now. We have a Karachi government that the CDL cliche no one goes for. And what they do is they make they say things, they do things, but they didn't actually promise elections. And when people say you break the party, they say, oh sorry, I know that's not manifesto, but we make the compromise as part of the coalition. Or, oh, we don't have enough money for some labour. Blame the Dow Scotsman in the back seat. Don't blame us, we have nothing to do with it. We're, like, we're going to use scapegoats wherever we can. So here we have the government that can basically use the either one of the parties as a human shield because simply to say, we made a compromise, not we're lying, we're cutting this country to a point where it's going to basically be the worst ever before. And at the end of the day, this government simply does not have the <coughs> um, right if they're going to constantly break promises in the major elections. Yeah, you all vote. Opposition. Charles Reese Wilson. Um, I'm actually quite surprised to see that David Lammy has made an incredible effort to come up to Cambridge this evening um, to propose this motion of no confidence because I see from my turn card that he doesn't seem to have much confidence in his own side because he turned down the opportunity to serve on the front bench. I suggest that Mr. Lammy has really only got confidence in himself. Denying, you have no confidence in yourself. <laughs> a, a, a point in abstention. Right. I've sat here and listened to all of you. And <laughs> I'm amazed at the fact that these words are coming out of my mouth. But right now I agree with Mr. Farage. We've heard how crap these guys are. We kicked them out of government for that reason. Can we hear why we should have confidence in you?
side sucks. And, and that's really all that's being said is that you're saying that, that the labor sucks, and you're saying that, uh, that the coalition sucks, but what is good? We don't come to this debate to find out, um, do we hate your government? We want to find out what's a government that we can support. So I'd like to hear from the last speakers, not so much why is the other side bad. <coughs> Show us a government that we can stand behind, that we can have confidence. We'll do one last round of floor speech, so point in propositions. Richard Johnson, Jesus College. Now, Rupert Myers has talked a lot about short-term memory loss. But I argue that this side, the opposition, has a selective memory loss. They seem to forget that the Tories supported the wars in Afghanistan and the wars in Iraq. Oh, nice. They seem to forget that the Tories and the Lib Dems supported Labour's spending plans for the first decade of the Labour government. And in fact, the Lib Dems said that the Labour government should be spending more. What the opposition also seems to forget is that before the crisis, Labour delivered 10 years of unbroken economic growth. The end of they months. seem to have forgotten that there was a lower deficit under the Labour government before the crisis than under John Major. And they seem to forget that when Labour left office in May, GDP was on the rise when last quarter we saw the economy shrink by 0.5% and youth unemployment rise by 101,000, which is the highest it's ever been since, well, they were last in government. <laughs> I want to say is how pleased I am to be in Cambridge because Cambridge doesn't have a Bullingham club. Yay! <laughs> it has to be an immediate plus. 
secondly, I am very pleased indeed to be supporting and advocating this motion. Uh, oh, you, you need the bell, not me, don't you? <laughs> uh, ding dong. Um, <laughs> Um, because never in our history have we had two parties who have not only abandoned their own manifestos but have already started to abandon their own coalition agreement. And they're doing so on the promise of economic policy. I was very entertained a moment ago to hear that uh, government should be in power to damp down growth. I thought that the job of government was to encourage and support and foster growth uh, no pun on your name, of course, Don, but uh, uh, we, we, we believed that we were supposed to be fostering growth until, of course, this lot came in and has just been described in the debate earlier. We've ended up with growth in the last quarter collapsing. Now, apparently, some of this is due to the snow. They don't have snow in Denmark and Norway and Finland and Canada and northern United States, but we do, and it damps down growth. And Tony Blair agreed with damping down snow. Yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, we've had a, a complete vote fast on the health uh, service, which has been described already. I, my wife's a, a doctor, and she came in to be a doctor, uh, not a commissioner or uh, uh, a manager, or even uh, to buy in American companies, which is what this is all about. But we've got a massive uh, change in the education system which was not predicated or promised. In fact, Don and I used to be friends. We used to get on, we used to go to teachers' conferences and he'd be agreeing with the NUT and getting on his feet and booing with the best of them every time I spoke. But afterwards we'd agree that we actually wanted to invest in education. We wanted everyone to have an equal chance in life. And Don and I also agreed on local government, that local government should not have the plug pulled on it, that we shouldn't be actually destroying people's life chances. We should be building trust in active citizenship and politics rather than undermining it. Instead, we've got what David Davis described as the Brokeback Coalition. <laughs> and I want tonight just to return to one of the fiascos of my life, which was for charity to do Celebrity Mastermind. And I chose as my subject area, Harry Potter. <laughs> and I just want you to think for a moment about the Potter novels. I want you to think of the Death Eaters sucking the life out of our country. <laughs> well, he knew one or two things about the black arts. And I'd like you to think of David Cameron as Snape. I'd like you to think of the Liberal De Democrats as the House of Slithering joining the coalition. Uh, I'd like you to think of, uh, of Voldemort taking over Nick Clegg to become Mad-Eyed Moody. Um, I'd, I'd like you to think of the Ministry of Magic under the auspices of Cornelius Fudge, known as Michael Gove. Um, <laughs> where the curriculum is to be determined centrally, where uh, Hogwarts uh, has been denied the investment they needed, so that uh, building spells for the future has been withdrawn. <laughs> I'd like you to think of the way in which uh, even the most detailed uh, curriculum on uh, developing uh, the black arts has been taken over by the Ministry. Even uh, the, uh, the prisoners in Azkaban have been allowed out so long as they gave their password for their internet connection so they could be followed through if they got up to no good. This is the kind of world we are currently living in. Actually, on the point... Do you not realise that when Rowling was writing about Azkaban, she was saying that people were being locked up and tortured unfairly. Uh, if you've read the books, you'll know that several people are sent there totally and grossly unfairly, much in the same way as that your government did that to members of the public. But Azkaban, of course, was for the Death Eaters. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I wish we had it today. Actually, I was about to say that I have a secret weapon against the Coalition. It's a black dog. <laughs>
that will reveal itself in due course as serious black. Um, as we drive this coalition apart, as the internal contradictions of it are revealed, we'll realise that the Liberal Democrats have made the most terrible error. Nick Clegg is a constituent uh, next to mine. He holds the Sheffield Hallam constituency. How could anyone represent a city like mine and allow the plug to be pulled on the most cutting-edge manufacturing international company like Sheffield Forge Masters? It was a betrayal and a disgrace for which he personally in my city will never be forgiven, but it was indicative of a failure to understand what had happened. What had happened in the last three years was the collapse of the world economy, the meltdown in confidence and trust, and a collapse in the financial institutions. And yes, we were too reliant on the financial institutions, but everyone was benefiting and applauding the progress that had been made in them. And when they collapsed, we had a choice. Either we let the banks collapse and all the consequences with it, or we invested in them as we have. And what's interesting about the deficit reduction strategy is that they haven't included the sell-off in the banks in their, formal, in their formal predictions of the future. And the consequence of that, of course, is that they've got a nice little nest egg coming to try and bribe the British people in three years' time. In the meantime, mass unemployment, cuts in services, destruction of benefits, undermining of housing prospects for the people of Britain for the future. The National Institute for Economic and Social Research just said this week that this strategy had more to do with a desire for a slimmed down state than the need to project a fiscally credible reduction strategy. And that is true. Fiscal policy is too tight, they said, because it's restricting growth, restricting jobs, and making the people of Britain pay a price for the failure of this government. So we have a choice. As in 1945 and 47, uh, as David Lummy said, we could invest in our future and take time to repay the debt that is built up. In 1947, we took out a loan from the United States. We replayed that loan, not in 55, 59, 64, 74, or in Margaret Thatcher's 79 to 92. We repaid that loan under the Labour government of 2002. I don't advocate that we can afford to take that long in terms of credit ratings to be able to pay off the deficit. But we've seen what's happened in the Republic of Ireland, where the cuts that David, uh, uh, that David Cameron applauded led to a meltdown of their economy and further cuts. What we should be doing now is investing in growth, investing in jobs, putting the people of Britain before the needs of the wealthy. And in doing that, we can afford to invest so that young people can come to Cambridge, so that young people can have a future, not by cutting the education and maintenance allowance, the Child Trust Fund, Youth and Careers, the Future Jobs Fund on that point. Well, fir firstly, we could restore the levy on the bankers. Secondly, we, secondly, we could restore the investment in ensuring growth so we could pay for it. And thirdly, we could ensure that in investing in our people, we do not let down our future. You are our future. We are our future. We need to do it together. And that's why you should vote for this motion tonight and indicate that we have no confidence in this rotten coalition mess.
Well, Madam President, it's uh, great to be back in this great uh, union. It's 23 years since I occupied that chair which you are gracing uh, tonight. And um, I know that nostalgia isn't what it used to be, but I do uh, think um, about some of the great debates which took place in this chamber uh, when uh, I was here. And um, I think that it's important at the outset of this debate, which in my time was traditionally uh, one of the most important debates of the year, to recognise the point that's been made by several speakers, that politics is extremely important, uh, it really matters. I remember the great debates here on the power of the state, the role of the state between Keith Joseph and Peter Shaw, alas, neither of them with us today, but seconded on that occasion by Roy Hattersley and Tom King, both of whom are still uh, thankfully with us, making their contribution to politics. Politics uh, really matters. I think that I should congratulate David Lammy on making his maiden speech in this chamber. He said some extremely disobliging uh, things about this great university, uh, but I hope that he will return uh, many times again in the future now that he has lost his virginity, so to speak, uh, tonight. I remember a wonderful debate uh, Madam President, um, which had Albert Pierpoint in it, who was the last uh, British official hangman. Indeed, his father and his grandfather had occupied that uh, position. And he informed a stunned and incredulous uh, chamber of the Union that he had joined this profession, and I quote, because he wanted to travel the world and meet interesting people. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, we will understand the incredulity that people here felt um, on that occasion. When I was last here speaking in the No Confidence debate, which was about uh, three years ago, no one could be found to defend uh, the government. And finally, an extremely uh, bright Labour activist uh, came out and spoke in the debate, a gentleman by the name of, I think, Daniel uh, Zeichner, and uh, it was clear uh, that uh, the Labour Party had had to go through their Rolodexes from A to Z before they found anyone who was willing then to defend uh, the government. Now, Madam President, uh, I urge the House tonight to reject uh, the motion. I don't do that uh, because of the unprincipled coupling that we've seen on that side of the House, particularly between the two Davids and Nigel uh, Farage, although I think it is a most, it is a, uh, just one moment, it is a, it is a, it is a most, it is a, it is a most unlikely coupling, and I think that the best can be said of it is that it is in the finest tradition of my enemy's enemy is my friend. I give way. Is our coupling in this debate this evening more unlikely than the coupling of the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives together in well, government? I'm coming, I'm coming precisely. I'm coming uh, precisely to that point because I think, and I submit uh, to the Chamber tonight, that the coalition government is something which the British public quite like. I think it, we, haven't had a, we, haven't had a, we haven't had an arrangement like this for 80 years. The last time there was a coalition government in peacetime uh, was in the 1930s. All parties, of course, to some extent, are coalitions. Uh, the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, is a coalition. There are those people who, when uh, in the Labour Party, who, when David Blunkett was Home Secretary, regarded him as an extremely right-wing and authoritarian uh, figure. There were people. There were people. There were people in my party who regarded him as an extremely right-wing and authoritarian uh, Home uh, Secretary. And for the coalition between the Liberal Democrats. Uh, my honourable friend here and myself, this is an exciting uh, arrangement. It's an exciting uh, coupling. It is, as it were, as if we were in the honeymoon phase of our relationship. Uh, we are still uh, folding the towels uh, neatly in the bathroom. Uh, we are still, um, as it were, uh, having the right etiquette uh, in the political bedroom. We are still polite and respectful to each other. But I think the public like the fact that two parties who cannot uh, get uh, everything they want, who are prepared to, I'm just coming, are prepared to compromise and negotiate on their programme. That is what the public uh, want us to do. And my plea tonight, uh, in the coolness before you go and vote, is to give this coalition government the chance to make the changes, which regardless of politics, this country desperately needs. Yeah. Uh, can you play 
is our support the government purely based on novelty? Because that novelty is going to wear off sooner or later. Well, I, I return to the point that I have just uh, made, to plea for time so that we can tackle these problems and that we can try also to carry people like uh, David with us on many of the reforms that we are going to make. And I give way to David. Just to say to the Secretary of State that you have been in power now for some time. You've talked tonight about towels. You've talked about your time uh, in that chair. You've praised David and, and others. You've said nothing of substance about what this government's doing. Perhaps the students should ought to hear what the government's actually doing. Well, I'm coming to precisely that point. <laughs> identity, car I identity cards scrapped. Tax on the least well off stopped. Welfare reform tackled. Uh, operational allowances for our troops doubled. Control orders are scrapped. Tackling with the. <laughs> Tackling with determination and firmness the elephant in the sitting room, which is the economic inheritance. And let me be quite clear about this. The, I'm not saying that the Labour government, when it was in power, was entirely responsible for the crisis, the economic crisis in which the country uh, now uh, finds itself. But I think we should all of us reflect for a moment, uh, quietly, on just what the state of the British government's finances are. First of all, we have an annual structural deficit of £155 billion. The interest payments every day on that are £120 million. We are paying more in debt interest than the total budget on defence or education. For every £4 we are spending, £1 has to be uh, borrowed. There is debt of £2,500 for every man, woman and child in this country every year. And it's not uh, just our generation that is indebted, it is your uh, generation as well. £15,000 per head. In one generation, one Labour government has doubled the national uh, debt. And as if to add insult to injury, the Labour Chief Secretary, when he left office, thinking no doubt it was humorous, left a note for his successor saying that there is no uh, money left. Now, the party opposite has attacked everything we have done uh, tonight. We have not had one single constructive idea for how they would tackle this deficit. As a matter of fact, the outgoing Labour government had pencilled in reductions in expenditure of 20%, not one of which they have told us how they would have funded. And the coalition government's reductions, in fact, are 19.6%. So the people who have caused this mess, the people who have no constructive ideas whatsoever, the people who attack everything that we do, the people who are around uh, Gordon Brown, Ed Balls and Ed Miliband, they are now uh, back in power. They have learnt nothing. They have forgotten nothing. Madam President, you cannot attack a plan from the coalition if you do not have any plan yourself. Yes, I give way. I'm, I was careful to preface my remarks by making clear that the Labour government was not responsible for all of the crisis, but I think that all of us, wherever we stand in politics, should at least face up to the reality of the figures which I uh, mentioned uh, just now. Now, we will seek... I'm very grateful to you. Why then does the government think it's a good idea to have to borrow £10.6 billion additionally
without that necessity to borrow even more money. Well, once again, the House is entitled tonight. The House is entitled tonight to uh, hear from the leader for the, of the Labour Party's case tonight where any of these cuts would come. And the point that uh, David makes demonstrates once again that there's plenty of arguments for spending. There always are in a democracy. But what we need to hear are the harsh, harsh choices that have got to be made uh, by the government. And we will seek to take the necessary action, not because we want to, but because we have to. We have the lessons of Greece and Portugal and Ireland. We will seek to be fair. We have said that we will uh, increase taxes for a quarter of the problem and reduce expenditure for the other three quarters. We are in choppy waters. I submit that we are out of the danger zone. Interest rates in this country have dropped. The AAA status of our finances has been preserved, and we are paying down debt burdens. And I want to make it absolutely clear, just give me a moment, I want to make it absolutely clear that any suggestion that this government is not absolutely pursuing economic growth, doing everything we can to ensure that economic growth provides employment and lifts up our economy, is absolute nonsense. If you listen to the Prime Minister on any occasion when he is talking about business or to business, he makes it clear that that is absolutely critical for our progress. kind of Tory that I, I quite like. But, but why is it fair for bankers to pay $2.5 billion in tax and for the British public to experience $90 billion, $90 billion in cuts? We have raised from the banking industry almost three times what the last Labour government uh, raised. So the point, in my, my view, is completely irrelevant. Um, remember, as you vote tonight, what we started with. An economy built on the worst deficit, the most leveraged banks, the most indebted households, the biggest housing boom, unsustainable levels of public uh, spending. And remember who got us into this mess. You don't have to, as a great former Labour politician said, uh, look uh, in the crystal ball. You can read the book. In fact, there are many of them. Alistair Campbell's book, Jonathan Powell's, Peter Mandelson's, Tony Blair's. And they all lay bare the same ugly facts. A country's finances destroyed. A system of governance subverted. For narrow tribal political gain. The feuds, the spin, the deception. Once again, just as in 1979, a Labour government has nearly bankrupted this country and it falls to the coalition together to try and save it. Thank you very much. in the chamber at 9pm um, and tickets for our Valentine's Ball are, are on sale in the bar now and at any time during the day featuring the Actors of Awesome who are a great band and lots more exciting things so do get your tickets for that. Um, you vote by which door you leave, eyes on the right, nose on the left, abstentions down the middle and can we thank our speakers one last time.